Good morning and welcome to worship on this 23rd day of January 2022, the third week of the season of Epiphany. Before I begin with confession and forgiveness this morning, a quick update. You'll notice that I am not in the sanctuary at St. Stephen to record worship for you this morning. This is because this week I have remained at home. Earlier in the week, I tested positive for COVID. I'm feeling a little under the weather, definitely feeling worn out, but I'm still able to record this and offer it for you. It'll just look a little different. It'll just be you and me here in my kitchen, including my cat Millie will be with us, I guess. And we will begin with confession and forgiveness. Thank you for your prayers and for your flexibility. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates us, who redeems us, and who calls us by name. Amen. Gathered together this morning, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and against your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us, and reflect the love that you have for us amongst all of creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, and you are an inheritor of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, the gospel of the Lord. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. 
we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or to detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Sound familiar? This is, of course, Abraham Lincoln's great, vocalized, long-remembered speech, the Gettysburg Address. This was originally delivered on November 19, 1863, but it remains. It persists. Now, are there other great speeches that you can think of? Can you think of other momentous words that have lasted? Can you bring to mind other speeches? I can think of quite a few. On August 28, 1963, at the mall in Washington, uh, just jam-packed with people, I can see the black and white footage, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. Also in Washington, D.C., a few years earlier, on January 20th, 1960, JFK gave his inauguration speech. Ask not what your country can do for you. Can you think of any great speeches? On July 4th, 1939, inside of Yankee Stadium, uh, that, that speech that we've all seen the footage of, man hat in hand, echoes reverberating through the stadium. It's Lou Gehrig's luckiest man alive speech. On July 20th, 1969, a shorter speech, we could say maybe it's a quote, but I'll call it a speech, was given off earth, but broadcast all across it. July 20th, 1969, it's Neil Armstrong's quote, but I'm going to call it a speech. That's one small step for man, one, you know the speech. And all the speeches don't have to be American either. There's Winston Churchill's, we shall fight on the beaches, we will never surrender speech, given over the radio in 1940. As Lutherans, we maybe are able to draw to mind uh, the Roman Catholic Church's Diet of Worms from April 18, 1521, of which the only recording is print. And this is where Martin Luther uh, ended up being excommun excommunicated after he gave his Here I Stand, I Can Do No Other speech. Speeches are foundational. We remember them. They're a part of our lives. As people of faith, we know that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew 5, is a speech. And this speech is consistently ranked among the greatest speeches of all time. We can think of speeches, shared vocalizations that we've experienced and we can bring to mind. How about you? Are there any speeches that you can remember that I didn't name? Do they all have to be so long ago? Are they all in the past? Do they all have to be so famous or so grand? Maybe uh, a speech that you have or that you remember is from a teacher or a parent or a grandparent. 
maybe it was some kid on the street or some local politician instead of national one, I don't know. Do they all have to be so long or can they be short like Neil Armstrong's? Can you think of a speech? I don't know if you know this or not, but we, the people of Summit County, have famous speeches in the water. This is part of who we are. I just recently learned what a rich history we have on one of the most famous speeches of all time and how we have played a part in that. It's in our water, it's in our air. It belongs to Summit County. It's been taught to children through all the generations. Uh, it is uh, prominent for being uh, a speech given by a woman in a time when women didn't speak. It is prominent for being a speech given by an, uh, a freed slave in a time when black folks didn't speak. This is, of course, Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman speech, which was given in Akron, Ohio. Did you know that? Did you know our link to great speeches? This was on June 21st, 1851. In thinking about this, I've been wondering, are we past the era in which the power or the change that can happen to us through the spoken word will happen? Are we past this era? Have words ever been so vocalized in your lifetime, in an event that you've been at, that they made such a difference, had such an effect? Have you ever been in the midst of a great speech? Are there any great speeches that you've ever experienced? Are we ever going to experience a great speech again? I think about it. Maybe Twitter and things like that, social media, has ruined public speech. Maybe our venom and our overuse of superlatives has ruined it. I don't know. Maybe we're too uneducated to give great speeches anymore. Maybe we're, the rest of us are just too listless to sit through one. Maybe our society is too segmented. We no longer have three stations, we have a bazillion, and so we're too cut into tribes and packs to have a singular unifying experience of language that we hold in common, the vocalized word that we experience together anymore. It's scary to think about it the era, the time of the great vocalizations is past. When I think about it, I get sad, my feelings overwhelm me. But then the rational, informed part of me sweeps in and calms me down. And when that happens, I remember that that's not quite right. Speech, even back then, has always been complicated. Think, for example, about Abraham Lincoln. Is the Gettysburg Address the only speech that Abraham Lincoln ever gave? No. There's the Lincoln-Douglas debates that are still talked about. There's the House Divided speech. There's even the Emancipation Proclamation, which goes to show just how complicated the language and the vocalization of it and speech can be. The Emancipation Proclamation was not really a speech. It was a proclamation. It was something written down. But it ended up being read aloud and it was read variously, and it was heard variously, and it has a strange mixed up legacy to this day. Speech can be complicated. When Lincoln read it to his cabinet, months and months and months before he uh, actually released it as a signed presidential document, the whole cabinet's reaction was, don't do this. When the 10 states that it was addressed to, and it was only addressed as 10, the succeeding states heard it, uh, they actually strengthened their resolve to continue the Civil War. It didn't actually help end it. When it was read in Union camps uh, among soldiers, uh, they had slaves, uh, freed slaves gather around, and there was a sense of uh, purpose in what they were fighting for that, that came over them. And the Civil War from then on out uh, became a discussion about being a war over slavery and while that's true, uh, all of history shifted to talk about that, even though it was more about more than that, and the purpose of the Emancipation Proclamation is about more than that. Speech is this complicated. There were border states that were neither succeeded nor in the Union, that when they heard this weren't quite sure what to make of it. There were people in the Union, in the North, in the countries, in the states that were fighting right alongside Abraham Lincoln that 
appreciated this and there were those who didn't. My point being that speech has always been complicated. That we think uh, that we own a marketplace on the complication of speech and whether a great speech will ever be made again. But the truth is, his speech has always been this complicated. And Lincoln himself in the Gettysburg Address uh, thought that, boy, my oration, my vocalized word is too simple and no one's going to remember this. And boy, would he be surprised. Speech is complicated. An experience a manifestation of the divine through our spoken words is complex and confusing. Speech is really complicated and it always has been. And I wonder about it. How do you feel about it? Will a great momentous speech ever happen in our midst again? All of our great speeches seem to be in the past. Will any more ever be delivered? Will a great unified effect of vocalization ever happen to us again? Can God ever be so vocalized as to literally in the moment bring relief or resolution or hope? Can God create something with God's word by the spoken voice again? When Jesus stood up in the synagogue in his hometown, he vocalized or gave voice to scripture that people already knew. The scroll was handed to him, and he read from it, and what he read became complicated and upsetting for people after he set it down and said later, in your hearing this, it has been fulfilled. When he said later that all he wanted to add was he believed that words can really happen. Well, that's when it got complicated and everybody got upset and Jesus began his own sort of pathway towards a cross. Speech has always been complicated. Is something powerful ever going to happen again? Will we ever share a revolution that comes about through the spoken word? If all this feels complicated, it's because it is. The Holy Spirit is peculiar. The Holy Spirit lifts, the Holy Spirit creates, and it creates experience, but only where the Holy Spirit will. Enduring experiences only really happen on their own. We don't have as much control over what words become an experience as we may think. The Holy Spirit is its own swelling power. It is a power that is more than the speaker's own. On the one hand, this is pretty simple. The truth is that neither you nor I are likely to encounter the next great speech today, nor this week, nor this month, in the next decade, we might not encounter it again in our lifetimes. It's not going to ever be anything like those great speeches again. They may or may not, but they may be a thing of the past. There will probably not be any new luckiest person alive, or I have a dream, or ask not, or ain't I a woman speeches for you this week, or maybe even in our lifetimes. No, those are its own vocalizations, and certainly the world is different. But that doesn't mean that this, this isn't Summit County. And that doesn't mean that there isn't something in our water here. That doesn't mean that speech can't do something. This week, you are going to speak and you are going to be spoken to. Your audience may be large, or it may be relatively small. It may be a digital audience, it may be an office cohort, it might be just you surrounded by your family at dinner, it might be an audience of one, it might be you and your cat. But you are going to speak and you are going to encounter speech. And with how peculiar the Holy Spirit is, in the midst of that, you just may encounter the vocalization of God's presence. 
How will you speak? How will you honor what is spoken to you? Does it build up? Does it lift? Does it offer creativity and hope? Is it something from which you can learn? Is there an expression of need in it? I'm not sure that we're ever going to hear one of those great speeches again. Maybe the time for that is past. They all seem to be in the past. But that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit can't still use a vocalization of myself or of you for a moment to happen. Because words are just words until they become the word. Words are just words until they become an experience. What words will you speak and what words will you hear? Will they be words that hallow? Will they be words that consecrate? Will they be words that dedicate and that lift up and that build? Or will they just be more of the same? I'm not sure if there will ever be any great speeches again. I'm not sure uh, what it would take for us to hear something culture-wide like that anymore. And there's part of me that gets worried about that. But I do believe that the Holy Spirit is peculiar. And I do believe that in your speech today, in this week, a holy consecrated thing can happen. And I believe that the real power of speech, the real power of those moments and the real power of your moments this week is not the symbols, uh, the noises, but that instead, the power of it is what it does to people and what it becomes for you. I do actually think uh, some great speech will happen. It'll be you where you take a stand and where you share. It'll be in a room where you're at, where you listen and believe and offer aid. And I believe there and in those places and in those experiences, the great vocalization of the divine occurs and that it can occur in its own way, even now. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful Lord God, it is you who caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. We ask, gracious God, that you would help us to indeed hear them, that you would help us to read, mark, and learn, that you would help us to inwardly digest your word, so that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of our eternal life. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Stay safe. I hope to see you in person soon. Take care.